Welcome to the episode of Jay Allen's Garage Pandemic Edition. This is one of our uh, restoration blogs. This is where we show you, well, what we've been up to the last few months. Although well, not a whole lot considering everything that's going on. This is my Panard BT24. This is a French car, two cylinders, about uh, 850 cc's. These are pretty cool little cars. We're just doing it back to its original color. Uh, as you see, it looks pretty nice. Still got to do the interior. Has a lot of interesting features. We'll, we'll do a whole uh, segment on this car when it's done. I just wanted to show you what project we're working on. You know, as you know, uh, the guys get to work on their own stuff here as well. And Pear, you know, our painter, he's painted almost everything here, including this. This is his car right over here. This is, a, I'm going to show it to you in a second, a 56 Ford. He's just done a fabulous job. Come on, let's take a look. You all know Pear Blix, our painter. Uh, he does all the cars here, as I just mentioned. This is his 56 Ford. He's restoring it here at the shop as well in his spare time. I think he's doing it in my time, but apparently he says it's his spare time. But it's all right. It's all right. It doesn't matter. But uh, very cool. As you can see, he's put this glass roof on it. It's going to be it's going to be nice when it's done. I don't want to spoil it. But if I thought I'd just give you a taste, just the color combination, the gray and the maroon. Uh, it's not a factory color, obviously. Uh, it's sort of a resto mod. It'll have a modern engine, but we haven't figured out what the engine is yet. But, uh, well, just give it a taste. Come on, let's move on to the next project. Well, this is a car nobody's seen before, at least here at the shop. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge fan of Bruff Superior motorcycles, the SS100. Uh, a lot of people know that George Bruff did make cars. He only made about 85 of them, but this is one of them. This is a Bruff Superior car. We're just getting it ready, and uh, we'll have more on this later. But nice looking thing, had a lot of the rough touches to it. It's basically just a Hudson that's been rebodied, but that's okay. Uh, we'll have more on this a little bit later, just to give you a taste. Here's the one over here I want to show you. This is our Tabo Lago Grand Sport. Come on, I'll show you this one. Here's a really rare, unusual car, a 1953 Tabo Lago Grand Sport. They only built, I think, something like 19 of these. This was a lost car. Uh, you know, Peter Larson wrote a terrific book on these, uh, the definitive history of these Grand Sports. And this car was missing. It was the only car that was missing. This is serial number 1102. I came about acquiring this because a car collector who was 98 years old uh, told me about it. I went to his garage. He bought it in 1965 in France. He flew it back to America. He got a one-day trip from the Department of Motor Vehicles to drive it from the airport to his garage in Orange County. He drove it to the garage in Orange County. He parked it in 1965. It never moved again. He had a lot of cars. I don't know why he didn't drive it, but he just didn't. So it's probably the only one in original condition left. Uh, I know it's the only one I think it still has the original bumpers on it because these were used as, well, just as you use any car. A couple were found abandoned on the streets of Paris, you know, things like that. 4.5 liter, six cylinder engine. As they say in the auction book, slight recommissioning. When he parked it, he parked it with a full tank of gas. If you've never seen 24 gallons of gas, what it looks like after 60 years almost of sitting, or 50 years of sitting, uh, well, we had to pull the gas tank. When we pulled the gas tank, I put my hand on it. It's a little bit of pressure. My hand went right through it. Here's some pictures of the gas tank. And uh, you know, Jimmy, our metal guy, he does such beautiful work. He copied the original tank perfectly, taking all the fittings off of it. Well, here, here's his original tank. Here's the original tank. Here's the one he made. Um, it's amazing. All the gas completely evaporated, but took all the metal with it. So they're just literally handfuls of metal dust in the tank. The tank was just filled with gasoline that had eaten the metal, and the two had somehow congealed. I don't know, but it was uh, pretty bizarre, pretty bizarre. Uh, the brake lines were all frozen. The brakes were frozen. Uh, the interior still looks beautiful. I'll show you that in just a second, and I'll show you the engine as well. Uh, Jimmy did a great job of fixing these doors. Uh, these 
you know, these are all wooden frames, so what happened was you'd open the door, it would immediately drop, and you'd have to lift it up to shut it. Now, look at that. Just shuts beautifully. We'll do an in-depth test on this one soon, but I'm going to show you some pictures. Here's what the door looked like when Jimmy took it off to give you an idea. He replaced a lot of the wood, uh, just did a wonderful job on both sides. Uh, this car is rare because it has a manual gearbox. You know, Anthony Lago, who teamed up with Talbo, he owned the patent to the Wilson pre-selector gearbox, and he made sure that all Talbo Lagos came with a pre-selector gearbox. And I'm sure this probably did. But this car was raced, apparently. It has Weber carburetors on it. And it's got a four-speed, I think it's a Porto Mousson, I think that's how you say it, uh, gearbox. That's a French gearbox that Chrysler also used. Uh, when we put it up on the rack and looked underneath, it looked like it was done at the factory. I don't think this was an aftermarket hot rod job, but I don't know. Peter Larson is still researching the car. He's trying to find some uh, history on it for me. Uh, you know, we found out it was used as a test car for some of the magazines, uh, but the interior is beautiful. I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, let me open up the hood and I'll show you what that looks like underneath. All right, I've got my cell phone out here. Uh, here is the engine. People think it's a twin cam. It's not. It's got push rods. They're the big Webers down there, as you can see. George did a wonderful job. George, our chief mechanic here. You know, this engine had almost no compression three or four of the cylinders that had nothing. Uh, we soaked uh, the rings with a combination of ATF, automatic transmission fluid, and acetone, let it sit for a week or two, fired it up, the rings came back, and now she's got 115 pounds on every cylinder, so that's pretty good. Let me show you the interior as well. I'm gonna reach down here and open the door again. You'll notice those door handles, much like my Cunningham. As you can see, the, the uh, Interior, 100% original, has that rich aromatic smell. Uh, this is a big car. The seats are just beautiful. I mean, there's one little cut in the leather right there. That's about it, but this is all the original leather. This car is really too nice to restore. So we're just going to keep it exactly as it is. There's the manual gearbox down there, as you can see. The gauges, we're still waiting for our... Uh, uh, that's the fuel gauge over there. We sent that out to get fixed and recalibrated. But Jimmy did a beautiful job redoing, uh, rehanging these doors. Let's uh, shut this hood and show you what else we got. This is a project we've been working on a long time. This car has probably been the longest restoration that we've ever had here. Must be. 12 years, 13 years, something like that, easy, uh, only because other things came along and got in the way. It's an early 20s Revere, could be a 20 or a 21. Uh, it has the famous Rochester Duesenberg walking beam engine. This is just a fabulous motor, the valves are on the side, and we call it a walking beam because you, if you took the cover off, you'd see the valves open this way. Uh, it's really cool, uh, just making up an exhaust system for it now. This was a really fast car. If you ever watch Wayne Carini's My Classic Car, he, uh, he had one of these for a while and was amazed at how quick it was because this is, this is what the Duesenberg brothers did. They built racing engines, and to make money, they put them in cars, and that's what the Revere is. Let me get the uh, cell phone, and I'll, I'll walk you around a little bit. Okay, there's that famous, can you read it, Rochester Duesenberg engine there. Look at the castings on this thing. Look at that exhaust system where it comes over the top. Big carburetor. Let me show you. We're now doing some wiring. Uh, brakes on the rear only, which is a little dangerous. This thing is really fast. Uh, we painted the body and restored the interior before we started working on the engine. And we had to make so many pieces for the motor. Uh, that it's, it's, it's very time consuming, but we're getting down to the wire now. So this is going to be running pretty soon, pretty soon. Uh, Three-speed gearbox, as you can see, it's a four-seater. Uh, kind of a cool looking thing. 
got the top. Come on, let's move on to uh, the Firebird. Here we are at our 1968 Firebird Sprint. I love this thing because it's a six cylinder, just a brief history for those who are not familiar with it. John DeLorean was a huge fan of the Jaguar XKE. He always wanted to build an American version of the Jaguar XKE. Uh, the closest thing he had since he was head of Pontiac was a Firebird. So he developed the Firebird Sprint with a six cylinder overhead cam engine. The first over cam, uh, overhead engine, I think, I think from a major American manufacturer. Uh, I mean, it cost Will St. Clair, and most people had them in the 20s. But I mean, in, in the modern sort of era of the 60s, it's basically a Chevy 6 with an overhead cam, and it had the, uh, a rubber belt drive, which was seen as revolutionary at the time. Big quadra jet on there. Uh, the guy I got this from, I think we talked about this before, he ordered it with all the performance options. And the trouble with this thing was, when you got the 6, and you order with the Quadra Jet and the custom exhaust system and all the high performance items, it only put about 215, 225 horse, and it costs more than a V8. So, of course, in the horsepower upset 60s, people went, Why would you buy a six when you can have a V8? But I liked it because it's extremely light, it handles well, and this is a real sprint, and it has the hood tack and it has all the performance options. Uh, the guy opted for power steering with the 6, which is, seems odd to me because it's, it seems so light anyway. The real sort of bugaboo on these engines were these, the rocker arms, okay? They wore, and they wore excessively. So oil pressure was kept low, so it didn't put too much pressure on the cam, and they just wore out. This is an original one. Uh, when we rebuilt this motor, we had these made and these are just beautiful, out of tool steel. We had them hardened, and then we used something called DLC, diamond-like coating. This has been run on the engine for quite a while, and you, it's not a wear mark anywhere. This way we can bring the oil pressure up a bit, uh, and uh, this engine should last a long, long time. I mean, you can see the wear on the original piece, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool. I mean, these are just, just beautiful. Look at these. We had these all custom made, so I'm real excited to get this thing going and fire it up. Uh, all right, let's, uh, let's move on and see what else we got. It's been rather quiet around here because of this pandemic, so I pulled some of the bikes out that I haven't ridden in a while and just redid them, flushed the tanks and recoded the tanks and did a few other things. This is my 66 BSA Lightning. I'm sorry, this is what motorcycles looked like to me when I was a kid. This was the fastest bike you could get. It was just a terror on the street. Now you get your doors blown off by Honda 400s. But back in the day, it was really, really cool. Let me get the, uh, my uh, cell phone, and we'll get some close-up shots and take you around these bikes. Fish. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. This is just a classically good-looking motorcycle to me. You can see the Kawasaki right next to it, which is a great bike, too but I just like this open look. Same thing this one here. This is my 64 Triumph Bonneville. This is one of my favorite Bonnevilles. You know, uh, every now and then you get a British bike that's just about perfect. And this one just shifts right, drives nice, extremely lightweight. Just a fantastic motorcycle. This one over here, I hadn't ridden in a while. The rubber had all gone soft and was completely deteriorating. This is a Vincent HRD Series A. I believe it's a 1938. This is number 50 of 75 built. Uh, just put new grips on it, flush the tanks, uh, and I take it around the block every now and then. These have become extremely valuable. I mean, just crazy money, but uh, they're just, just wonderful bikes to ride. I got it 30 years ago when it was still a bargain, although it seemed outrageous then at the time. But the price of these has gone up, God, 10, 10 12 fold, certainly. I, I don't say that because I, I never sell it. I, I like it as a motorcycle, not as an investment. But it's nice to know things go up in value, too. I love the fact that it has, see, is you've got a clock, as well as rather than a tack, you have a clock on it. And just a beautiful motorcycle. Another bike that's kind of interesting, 
I worked with Mobile One about, God, 13, 14 years ago to build this with SNS. This is just, this is one of the very first SNS crate engines. And uh, with Mobile One doing the lubricant and they kind of sponsored the build. And it's just a lot of fun to ride. Fast, fast bike. And we'll do a whole segment on this one as well. Uh, but I just thought you'd like to get a kick out of it and get a kick out of seeing it. You know, you can't just restore cars and forget about them. They require a lot of maintenance. This is my 66 Oldsmobile Toronado. Uh, this one, Hot Rod of the Year, I think, in 2006 in Hot Rod Magazine. We're really proud of that one. Uh, just a brief synopsis of it. We'll do another piece on this. We converted it to rear wheel drive. It's got 1,076 horsepower. Let me show you the motor. Uh, Oh, I love this car. This motor is just fantastic. Uh, as you see, it has twin turbos. Each turbo has its own cooling system. Uh, see this radiator there? There's a tank back there for this side. There's a tank for that side. And this is the main radiator for the car. We had to make our own pop-off valve because there was nothing commercially available. Uh, this thing is really fast. It's got Traction control, it's got anti-lock brakes. Uh, I think we'll do another piece on this one pretty soon because we really haven't done anything on this in about 10 or 12 years. Uh, it's a lot of fun to drive, and it's so impressive when you, when you open this hood. Uh, so I just want to give you a brief, brief glimpse of this thing. As you can see, the body is totally stock. We made our, own, made our own wheels. Let me show you those right there. They look like the stock wheel, but these are 17s instead of 14s. Uh, so, anyway, oh, and we 3D printed that part as well, the, uh, the air cleaner up there, the cover. Come on, I'll show you uh, what's happening with the electric. And finally, our 1914 Detroit Electric. This is one, hopefully, we're going to have it running by Christmas. I know we've said that before. Other things get in the way, but it's looking pretty good. Jim has been doing a fabulous job on this thing. You know, he checks, rechecks, and then checks everything again. And... What we wanted to do in the interior, although they didn't have radios in 1914, uh, we took a radio from the late 20s, early 30s, and adapted it. And well, here, let me get the uh, let me get the cell phone out again. I'm going to show you the interior here. It looks really cool. Okay, let me show you what's happening. There's an old Zenith radio. Jim did all the woodworking here. It's just beautiful. Look at that. So we'll have big, comfy chairs from 1914 to sit on. This is how you steer it right here. That's your steering wheel. And that's your throttle, that other one. Uh, as you can see, we got our inverters and everything else in here. This has got air conditioning and Bluetooth. But some nice details. Look at that. See where it says Edison Electric on there. What does it say? A Detroit Electric, I'm sorry. Can you see it right there? It says Detroit Electric right on there. That's one of the original plates. That's our radio and the beautiful woodworking and the speaker will be down here so oh and that's our batteries over here these are out of a nissan leaf there'll be a set in the front and the set in the back so that's the battery used to sort of run the auxiliary stuff the 12 volt that's for your air conditioner and uh we're getting really close so there you go Ha, <laughs> ha,